Senior White House officials say they are moving forward with a new deal on NAFTA. Friday was the Trump administration's self-imposed deadline for reaching a new deal. The White House announced earlier in the week it had reached a so-called understanding with Mexico. But on Friday, negotiations between the U.S. and Canada appeared to break down. Earlier in the day, the Toronto Star reported off-the-record remarks the president made during an interview with Bloomberg News on Thursday. In those remarks, Mr. Trump reportedly said the new trade deal would be, quote, insulting to Canada. President Trump slammed the, the publication of those remarks on Twitter Friday, but didn't deny, saying he added, at least Canada knows where I stand. CBSN political contributor Michael Graham is in Boston. He's also a columnist for the Boston Herald and a politics editor at NHJournal.com. Michael, how important is this issue to voters? Well, you know, the broad issue of trade as a thing, you know, this kind of abstract concept, not that big a deal, but the issue of jobs and employment that they see uh, tied to it is a very big deal. And I think that one of the things that uh, President Trump has, is able to say is when it comes to trade, the old line that uh, small government libertarians in the Republican Party and that the Obama administration largely said, which is that a rising trade tide lifts all boats, that's not good enough for his base. They're in, often in the industries that suffer because while the math is pretty clear that rising tide, does, that, that increased trade does help everyone and the o economy overall, Donald Trump is pointing to individual problems. And I think that the voters like to see Donald Trump talking tough on trade. We know Congress will have final approval of the new mm -hmm. trade deal. What kind of fight are you expecting to see over this from lawmakers? Well, that is interesting, isn't it? Because uh, there were a lot of newly converted free traders during the Obama era when President Obama was pushing things like the uh, TPP, the, the Trans-Pacific Trade Pact, and you know, defending NAFTA. There are people who are longtime anti-trade deal advocates who are suddenly you know, supporting NAFTA because Trump is against it. And that's just the power of Trump on politics, people all over the map. I think, though, what you're going to see is that because particularly NAFTA involves a lot of issues dealing with uh, unions, uh, auto worker unions, steel unions, et cetera, that you're going to see Democrats who the, in districts who still rely on those union votes, they're going to want to see a deal go forward. And it's going to be hard to go back to a community in Ohio or Pennsylvania that's heavenly union and say, I voted against the deal because Trump was for it. I don't know that they hate Trump so much that they don't want what, if, if it's a deal they perceive as good, that they want to kill the deal. Michael, in a column coming out on CBSNews.com next week, you write about how the president's trade policy is unclear, but that it sends a message. What is that message? Yeah, that's what's so fascinating to me is if you watch the president, if, if I, you know, before the election, before he took office, it was, let's blow up NAFTA, let's blow up trade, you know, let's, China's terrible. And then if you look at what's actually going on, this proposal that he has with, uh, that, that's on the table with Mexico, very, you know, kind of a, almost like a tweak, if you will. And it, it helps North America, no doubt about it. It means more pieces of the cars have to be made here in North America. It puts pressure on wages that will make it more advantageous for America and Canada versus Mexico. But it's very modest. And then the talk with Canada, I'm going to walk away from a deal. Whatever. It looks more and more like there's going to be this modest tweak of NAFTA that's not nearly connected at all to the way Trump has talked about it. But I think that's the key. I think there's a segment of voters, the ones I mentioned earlier, who, for whom trade has not been all upside. And when they see Trump talking this way, he's basically sending them a message, look, forget if it's 63% made in America or 73% made in America. For a change, you have a guy in the White House who's fighting on this issue, and he talks about it in ways they understand. You know, for example, steel. Steel's a very small percentage of our economy. By far and away, the effect of steel price changes is felt in other parts of the economy because they have to buy steel to make the stuff that they sell. But it's such an iconic image. I think it resonates with, particularly with the Trump base, with voters in their late 40s to early 60s who, you know, kind of think of that as America is steel and that's what we are. And so it's the way Trump talks about trade that on the political side I think is more important than almost than the results that he gets on it. Switching gears, President Trump said Thursday he would keep Attorney General Jeff Sessions employed until at least November. How are Republicans reacting to this announcement? 
every day that Jeff Sessions stays in their, in their office, they all just thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I think that while they were praying for Senator McCain at that ceremony today, some of them were quietly praying that Jeff Sessions would keep his job as well. It is such a not good issue for Republicans to have to have a fight for a new attorney general in this climate. That, that is a bad political move. I, it appears that President Trump knows that because we all know that he would love to fire uh, Jeff Sessions tomorrow, but he keeps not doing it. The president also doubled down on his claims that the Russia investigation is illegal, but a new poll from the Washington Post and ABC News shows 63% of adults support it. What does that mean for Republicans come November? I just, I, I want tr Trump supporters to really take a look at this poll today. It is a terrible poll for President Trump. His un disapproval number is up at 60%. You mentioned that it's very favorable to the Mueller side of the, of the debate. It's just one poll. It is kind of an outlier, and you look at it over time. But if you start seeing that kind of shift on the, uh, you know, on this fight that Mueller and Trump are having, and it's very much a political fight, whether, whether it should be, it doesn't matter. Over the summer, polls came out that showed more and more Republicans were buying President Trump's argument that was fundamentally biased, fundamentally unfair. If those numbers start to shift and Republicans start saying, no, there's something here you need to dig in, it's going to be harder for Trump to keep allies in Congress and, and to, you know, to keep a firewall should things go badly uh, with uh, Mueller's final report. And looking ahead to this week, confirmation hearings for the president's Supreme Court nominee, Judge Brett Kavanaugh, are scheduled to begin Tuesday. What are you watching for? Okay, so here's what everyone at home should watch for. TV ads. I don't mean like during the coverage, like ad ads. I mean, watch for senators presenting content for their up and coming TV ad because the assuming that there is not some, you know, drop out of the sky secret, you know, something out there. This is a done deal. Senator Kavanaugh has the support of all the Republicans. Senator Collins in Maine and Senator Murkowski in Alaska appear to be on board with the passing of Senator McCain. The uh, Republican governor is going to appoint a Republican to fill his seat. That means there'll be someone there to vote from Arizona. There's your 51 votes. It's done. Chances are a couple of Democrats will come on board at that point as well. So what are we left with for next week's hearing? It's going to be days of posturing for the cameras to send ads back home. Red state senators want their voters to know I'm with Trump and his pick and I love Kavanaugh. So look for lots of praise of Donald Trump loosely related to the actual nomination. On the other side, you're going to see uh, de Democrats who are running in different districts. I hate Trump and I hate it. I'm going to fight to the death and this is the most dangerous appointment. And they're going to be talking to the cameras. The actual part about judicial philosophy, they're not going to debate that. His record, it's, you can't touch his record. That's been the frustration for Democrats thus far. So look for lots of politics, not a lot of stuff actually related to picking a Supreme Court justice. And it's interesting, the witness list includes President Nixon's lawyer, John Dean, exactly. a school shooting survivor, and then <laughs> one of Kavanaugh's former colleagues in the Bush administration. What does this tell you about how Republicans and Democrats are approaching this? Uh, Democrats are going to stand up and say we're in a crisis. This uh, guy should not be allowed to be a uh, uh, justice because Trump is going to get impeached anyway. He's, you know, we're in this moment that borderlines fascism and John Dean is going to be there. John Dean, one of the most discredited people in American politics. I, I, I'm, I said this as a Republican. He was in a Republican administration. There, it's hard to find a lot of people who go John Dean, moral leader for the 21st century. Uh, and then on the Republican side, you're going to have uh, people pushing a philosophy, you know, their, their judicial view. They're going to, they're, they want to make it a commercial for how they think the court should operate. And uh, so it's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of politics and a lot of theater because Chuck Schumer just doesn't have the votes. Michael Graham, thank you so much for your political breakdown. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.